Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where we explore what it means to be a well-rounded, happy, goal-crushing athlete. Every week, myself, sports journalist Molly Herford, and cycling coach and kinesiologist Peter Glassford interview experts and chat through all of your training questions. We're excited to have you along for the ride. Hello, hello. Welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Peter, how's it going? It's going really well. Yeah, can't complain. Things are moving along here. How about with yourself? Is, is your running going vigorously and enjoyably? And I'm trying to think, what is the swap thing? It's uh, Is it some work in all play? Yes. my Yeah, my running is going amazingly. Uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in next week's episode when we're just sort of catching everyone oh, up. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but, you know, today we wanted to just get right into it. Uh, this is a an interview that we actually recorded a couple months ago and we've just been like waiting for the the right time to to get it out we had so much new year stuff just a lot going on so i'm really excited that we're finally getting this sandra walter interview out to the masses sandra is one of canada's longest i'm you know she might actually be the longest running professional mountain biker in canada it's hard to say i think kabush probably you know rivals in some cases World cup level true mountain biker true. kabush but, retired uh, from that a few years ago and, and i think sandra often gets that and probably jeff does too now this you know longest and you know long career but i, I think sandra especially as you say like she's been at the the peak of the sport like you could also say she's among our our best uh female racers yeah uh, in, in Canada, certainly, right? She's had some great results and, and improving results over the last couple of years. So I, I think we almost can look past a little bit the, the length of the career and just say she's like one of our best racers. Yes, absolutely. And I think that's what's so fascinating to me about Sandra. I mean, I've been interviewing her for, I mean, 15 years probably at this point, like mm-hmm. pretty much since the start of my career uh, in journalism. And I think what's amazing to me is, yeah, not just she, she hasn't just been racing. She's progressively getting better and better at a time when the women's mountain bike world cup circuit is actually getting more and more competitive her results are improving every single year which is just frankly amazing Uh, and we talk you know all about in this episode like you know she's she's not she's not getting any younger none of us are and we talk about how she's shifted her training over the years and you know how recovery has shifted and how she still loves the sport and that's sort of what what's keeping her her in it the constant improvement the genuine love for it uh and it's just it's such a fun episode but i mean you've you've known her longer than i, I have. would say sandra taught me a lot about racing and tra- certainly traveling uh, i was fortunate to travel to europe with her a bunch of years while we were doing sort of the more privateer you know t- you know we had to feed each other and uh you know on the Not race like, course yeah, well like i mean sandra bicycle, probably was like. cooking too honestly um but yeah and, and having her there someone who you know she has swiss relatives so she speaks a couple you know i don't know recall uh, she speaks like swiss german i think and then uh, uh, uh and it's just you know an asset when you're traveling you know she knew how to get places and trains and, uh, and all this stuff so i definitely learned a ton traveling with sandra over the years uh but as a racer too i always said even back then as you say 15 years ago i always thought of her as someone who just seemed to always be put together and you know had the right coat to wear and uh you know just you know, had the stuff and showed up and finished and raced really well. Uh, So I definitely took a lot uh, from, and have continued to take a lot from Sandra, you know, even just motivation to keep going uh, (laughs) with racing. I think, you know, I'm just like, well, Sandra can do it. I can do it. We're going to keep going. For sure. Yeah. And I mean, talk about a race. If you're going to race mentality, I've seen Sandra race in, you know, probably over a hundred races in real life. And I will say, every time i have ever seen her she is going a hundred and ten percent like i have never seen a racer as committed to racing which is just fantastic and i think also you know someone who's very kind as well and and you know very approachable and yeah just like someone you know i think is a great role model really Really what we're saying is we're going to start the sandra walter fan club if it doesn't already exist well i mean i'll put it out there now and we we've talked about this before but i think you know we need to be talking about the olympics and 2024 yeah, petition. making this campaign uh for sure yes absolutely which i might actually mention in this interview <laughs> <laughs> all right without further ado let's hear from the awesome sandra walter all right Sandra, welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm so excited to have you. Thanks for having me. It's been a dream to be on. <laughs> oh my gosh. I think I, I'm trying to remember, like, I've been interviewing you for a very long time now, it feels like, uh, for like all different places and publications over over the years. So uh, let's maybe just for listeners who aren't aware of your like long history in sport, give us like the, you know, 
30 second, like elevator pitch of like how you got to where you are now, uh, you know, as, as a world cup racer, when did you start? How long has it been? Give us everything. Oh, wow. I'm not very good at being succinct, but we'll try. That's fine. Um, so the first race I ever did was in 1996. I was 16. I came last, but I had so much fun and I finished when other people didn't finish. So I thought that was a win. Um, after that, I went on to join my high school mountain bike team, did really well, had lots of fun. Whoa, whoa, whoa. But- there was a high school mountain bike team back in 1996? Well, 96, 90, well, 97, 98, that, those were like the heyday of mountain biking, if you recall. That was like <laughs> when there was a lot of money in the sport and it was pretty, pretty new and exciting. So yeah, we had a high school mountain bike series. It was amazing. This is so funny to me because I feel like when people talk about like high school mountain biking, they talk about it as a thing that like just started like in the past few years and is just now coming up. And we tend to forget that like it already had its heyday and then it like kind of went down and now it's maybe coming back. We hope it's coming back, but it's really funny that 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 happened already. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I think it's making a comeback for sure. It actually, I feel it's become more of like, it used to be like this niche fringe sport. And I think it's actually mainstream. Like if you look at advertising, um, you'll see a lot of mountain bike specific things in bank commercials and insurance and whatever. Like it's, yeah, that, and that never used to happen. It used to be really unique. So Mm -hmm. Um, like every car commercial ever, when they're trying to indicate that like you can do cool stuff and like go off road, there's always a mountain bike on the back. (laughs) Yeah. But that's pretty, I think that's pretty recent that that's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So high school, then what? (laughs) Then, um, in 1998, I did this race up at Silver Star and I'm from BC. So basically I was, I loved racing and every possible race that there was in BC, um, I would try to get to it. So I'm like, there's one at Silver Star, mom, do you want to come with me? So we did this race and I ended up coming like sixth or seventh or like I had a terrible race because we'd camped up in the parking lot up at Silver Star overnight. It was freezing cold, took me like a whole lap to warm up. And anyway, had a bad race, didn't think anything of it. And then like a few days later, someone told me that that had actually been the national championships and I had qualified for the world championships as a junior. (laughs) But I was so new to racing, like I had no idea what any of it meant. But when I found out I qualified for worlds and people told me it was like, it actually was a big deal. I convinced my parents, it was hard to convince my parents to let me go because they're, they said, you know, there's so many races in BC. Why would we help you get to Quebec for a bike race? And, and I said, you know, like it's the world championships. Um, I think it's a big deal. So eventually they did, they did agree to help me get there. And that's where I really fell in love with the sport and really, well, I mean, like the racing part of it, where I saw all these amazing professional mountain bike racers making a living off of it, um, I could see, you know, what the potential actually was. And that really resonated with me. I had an amazing race. I was 15th um, and was just completely hooked after that. And I have been at 14 world championships since. Yeah. Okay. Which world championship was your most memorable out of the 14? I think, um, Mont Saint Anne in 2019 was very memorable just because it was on home turf. Like in Canada, it's pretty special. I had my best ever world championship result with a 19th place. Um, and it was actually the third world championships I'd been to in Canada or in St. Anne even because at 1998 and then 2010 and again in 2019. So yeah. So 21 years between your first world championship and your best world championship. Yes. Like let's let's just like reflect on that longevity for a hot second. How like okay, so you, in 1998 you're seeing it, you're like, "Oh my god, this is amazing. Like this is this is what I want to do." Most people change careers say like 7 times, 8 times in their life. This is 21 years more than that this that was 20 years then uh we're now like at 25 years of racing here 
Uh, how have you stayed motivated for two freaking decades of this? I don't know. I, I'm, I guess I'm stubborn. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I really just find joy in, in per- pretty much every aspect of it. I, I love the training um, most of the time. <laughs> Winter here can be pretty terrible, but um, I just love the way I feel on a bike. My whole community is, is mountain biking and cycling. Um, you know, my family and I love traveling. So that's a bonus because I get to travel a lot. Um, and I, yeah, I just share the sport with, with everyone around me. So it just feels like, it feels like home and it feels, I mean, I guess, cause I've been doing it for so long, it feels normal. <laughs> mm-hmm. So at what point did your parents like come around to like, Oh, the world does matter. Like you are going to be a bike racer. Okay. Or have they yet? <laughs> Yeah, I don't really know. <laughs> there, my mom does like every once in a while. She asks me, you know, are you? Is this fun? Like, because she sees how hard I work, and, <laughs> and you know, I'm I'm pretty much tired all the time, but I feel that's normal too. So, <laughs> but um, my parents were very incredibly supportive um, of my racing career, which was pretty amazing. And yeah, so they're they're proud of me and that's kind of all I need. I like that. You've also kind of in the past few years started doing a lot more with, um, with getting girls into mountain biking. Can you kind of just like walk us through that whole like other side of your life? I'm going to ask how you manage to like how you're balancing all of it with the training as a pro, but talk to me about getting girls into sport here. Yeah, I guess, um, later as I've gotten wiser and then later in my career, I've started to reflect a bit more on, on what the sport means to me and how I got into it and all that. And when I was a 16 year old girl mountain biking, there weren't any other girls mountain biking. I, all the people I rode with were boys, mm-hmm. which was great and fun, but it was also very different. And it was kind of like being thrown into the deep end. You just figure it out. And I also realized that not everyone learns the same way or is kind of comfortable in that environment so um I decided to start a girls ride club in in 2020 which it was during pandemic obviously I had taken that season off um just there weren't many races and I wasn't comfortable traveling at that point and then I realized I had time to actually do something about you know this this vision that I'd have of like why can't we just have more girls riding together for fun. Um, There are a lot of programs I feel that are kind of competition focused Mm -hmm. that also include girls or for girls, but there, there are a lot of people out there who really are not competitive. um, Don't are not interested in competing and are stressed out or, you know, intimidated by the thought of competition, even, or even just like coming to one of these rides and feeling like they're going to, embarrass themselves or you know they're not going to be the best or you know they're afraid of being the worst and so I I just figured out that I could maybe contribute to this and so my club was kind of like a group of girls riding together non-competitive just like super chill and it's just so rewarding when I'm leading these rides or following this group of young teenage girls through the woods and they're just blabbing away it's like the whole forest is just filled with teenage girls talking about life like oh it's just so fun I love that yeah and I think that's what we tend to miss I think like as especially you know a lot of our listeners have like younger kids that they're trying to get into cycling and I think we really miss that like just fun ride element there's like a lot of like ride with your parents and there's a lot of like ride with these like fairly competitive groups but there's not a lot of like, here's just this super chill, like fun. We're going to gossip. We're going to chat, like no pressure. And I think we need more of that. And the coolest thing is actually that a lot of the girls that have got, gone through my ride club, they, first of all, they keep coming back. So I figure I'm doing something right. But second, several of them have gone on to try racing. So I think really just introducing them in this really low pressure environment has actually help them build their skills and their confidence 
So once, and then they have a group of friends who are also riding. So then they together will, you know, they've joined the high school mountain bike program here. There's, there's still one in, in um, my school district or my old school district. And <laughs> so they, and then they go on to try racing and, and it's such a cool, like that's, that wasn't really my intention, but it is very cool that, that they're actually gaining this confidence that they, if they want, they feel that they can race their bikes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So that's 2020, you know, you have this year off of racing 2021 comes around and not only are you back to racing, you actually won short track nationals, uh, which again, like pretty amazing, like 20 odd years into a career. So, I mean, what's the deal? How did you, how did you win this like super short, super freaking hard event, which I mean, having like looked at, you know, your, your results from world cups over there, like you're also really solid at in like, even on like the, the world stage as well. So yeah. How do you get good at short track? (laughs) Especially because you started in the nineties, which means you were doing (laughs) these like stupid long races where it's like one lap of like, a 30 mile course, which we would now call like gravel racing or marathon. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So in the nineties, there wasn't really mountain bike specific training either. It was, we were mountain bikers were training like roadies. So we were doing super long, like long endurance rides. And it was very much like we train like roadies, which is interesting. Um, but I also, I did race a lot of road back at back in the day I didn't like it as much so I decided to kind of do other things but um that included a lot of criterium racing so I guess I picked up some tactical skills (laughs) from that and I definitely used those to win the short track national championship last year which was super exciting and like very unexpected for me maybe probably for everyone else as well um Honestly, I was like, I was a bit disappointed in the day before was the XCO national championship race. And I was kind of bummed with how I raced that um, tactically and just, so I I was kind of racing angry, which I'm also not like very, (laughs) not really me, but I was going to say, I can't see that. I like have no, I I can't understand that for you. (laughs) Yeah. Because usually like racing is all just like really joyful for me and like very positive but for some so but I was harboring these like negative feelings um from the previous day and I actually almost didn't start the race because I was it was I was so tired and just not in a very good mood and I was like oh do I really have to do this but I did (laughs) and I um yeah like if anybody tried to like kind of sneak in front of me it was a very tactical course it was um pretty not pretty flat there was only one climb short climb on it um it was through a campground and it was mostly like sand like wide sand with lots of flat corners which are technical as well but it wasn't like there weren't any obstacles other or that anything like that and but if anybody like tried to take my position I would just be like no like you're not you're not getting in front of me today like not having it and then we get to the last lap and like just before the base of the climb and I'm like, nobody is doing anything. And it's pretty like, it, it's kind of now or never, like, I guess they're all waiting for a sprint, but I didn't, I didn't even really, I just, I just realized nobody's doing something. If someone's going to do something, it has to be now, boom, that's going to be me. And so I attacked before the base of that of the climb which on the top of the climb was the the finish line and I just sprinted my little heart out and crossed the line first oh my gosh how did how did that feel was that your first like world cha- or world cha- uh, was that your first like national like win I won the national marathon championship in like 20. 20- 14 I can't remember <laughs> but I, I did I have a marathon um national title but yeah but in the in the recent in recent times um this is yeah it's a pretty but, big victory yeah because I know you have you do have 16 championship medals like yeah. in your in your career which is like but pretty the, 
pretty freaking impressive. Yeah. <laughs> The XCO one still eludes me, though. Like, that's still something I want. Ooh, okay. So is that the, uh, I guess that's the 2023 goal, perhaps? Nationals, yeah. I mean, national championships are always a, a big target for me. Like, it's a it's a special race. And so I always want to be on, on top form for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so 2019 best world's results 2021 this uh the short track win what did now did you change your training at all sort of between those two years because I wanted to ask like what a week of training generally looks like but broad strokes has training changed between those two years specifically I don't really think so <laughs> okay so that's that's great what is the training program like how <laughs> How, how do I get top 20 at world championships? What's that look like? My coach, I don't know. I just do what he says. Uh, <laughs> but my coach, Keith Wilson, is he's he's a pretty smart guy. Um, yeah, he's good at writing training programs, but he's also good at knowing his athletes. And I have been working with him since 2009. So, yeah, he knows he knows me pretty well. Um, and he also like he's very open to new ideas he doesn't get stuck in doing the same thing the same way all the time mm -hmm. um he's like one of those guys who's active on forums so he's a math teacher high school math teacher he does all that stuff for me because I am very not a numbers minded <laughs> I I'm an <laughs> I have a writing a writing degree and I'm very much an arts kind of minded person so I don't like thinking about all the all that stuff so luckily he does that for me. Okay, broad strokes, like how many like workouts are you doing? How many easy rides? How many long rides in like an average training week? So like no major race coming up, but we're like heading into competition phase, say. Okay, so Monday is generally off off. Um, I know a lot of people will still do something on Mondays, but Mondays are sacred. And <laughs> are have they always days. been or is that something you've like shifted over the years? Um, for a long time, they have been. Yeah. And I think just for like any athlete, you need it, you know, there's days that you need to like actually run errands and go to appointments and do life stuff. Um, and if you have to fit in a workout in there, or for me anyway, I find it challenging and it's supposed to be recovery day. So you're not supposed to be stressed. Um, so yeah, Mondays are sacred. And then Fridays are generally very, are like an easy day as well. So like maximum an hour and a half kind of easy ride normally. Um, and then like two, like if you're pre-competition, probably two uh, intensity workouts in there somewhere. Weekends are usually longer ride days for me um, because my friends, most of my friends have full-time jobs and are like <laughs> nine to fivers. So um, good weekends are good days to ride with my friends. And then kind of another long ride in there between the, the intensity workouts, endurance ride between the mm -hmm. intensity workouts. Just nice. because like, I think a lot of people forget that like your intensity rides are your kind of pillar rides. Um, they're the most important. So you sort of need to protect those rides. So if you go, if you know, if you go into them tired, you're not going to get what you need out of them. Um, so like when I do like a three, four hour, endurance ride like they're pretty easy um, yeah but that's they're supposed to be and I think a lot of people tend to go too hard 100 percent, yeah uh what about like strength and mobility have you added any of that in like recent years have you always done it have you never done it <laughs> um I really dislike going to the gym but luckily you can do stuff at home mm -hmm. um <laughs> so I yeah I, I haven't been going to the gym in recent years but I have been doing, like, I find doing just strength, mobility, like, and core stuff on a regular basis is really, really helpful, especially since I'm probably not as limber as I used to be and maybe a little bit more, you know, prone to injury with, you know, getting up there. <laughs> okay, knock on wood, you've been pretty, like, not even lucky. You haven't had any major injuries. Um, how? How is that possible? <laughs> Honestly, I feel a lot of it is probably genetics. Like I know some people are more prone to injury than others and maybe they just have 
you know, like, like tighter ligaments or whatever. I don't know. But Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I feel that that probably genetics plays into it. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't because I don't think I do anything really special to avoid injury. Yeah. Well, and it also seems like a lot of the women cyclists from our generation, we'll say, uh, and, and the generation under us have dropped out of sport because of red S or had to take like extended periods away from sport because of red S. And it seems like you've been able to pretty successfully navigate, not having to veer into that territory. Like how, how did you avoid it when like the pressures and I mean, even just like what we thought was the correct thing to do 10 years ago, uh, really would have like naturally led you down that road. I think I just like food too much. (laughs) Um, <laughs> that's what I always that's what I always say I'm like I've tried like yeah it's not like I didn't try to like unhealthily diet back in my early training days I just couldn't do it yep I remember I tried a some sort of like a cleanse diet for a week and it was like the worst week of my entire life <laughs> and I, couldn't, I couldn't do it yep Yep. (laughs) Yeah. I think the longest I've ever successfully dieted was like maybe 72 hours before I just epically cracked, but usually not even 24 if we're being totally honest. And like, I wanted to so bad. So yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I I think honestly that like, I remember talking in the kind of early days of when Keith was coaching me and it was back when the whole Lance Lance was king um and he you know there was all over the the cycling media that he like he weighed his food and was like super particular and I said to Keith because I definitely like I was a lot let's say bigger than I am now I was like if you look at photos from back in like the mid 2000s um I was there was definitely more to me and so I, and I was aware of that and I knew all about power to weight and all that. So I told Keith, I said, oh, maybe I should start like weighing my food. And, and he just looked at me and was like, Sandra, don't be stupid. Eat, <laughs> just eat when you're hungry. That's all you need to do. And, I was, and then, cause I would like limit myself. Like I would like during the season, I wouldn't let myself eat bacon or whipped cream. And then after that, I just was, oh, and then also, um, I don't, I'm sure you know, uh, Amanda Sin, but she had this, she had this, is it worth it diet? So like, Ooh, I like <laughs> that. I it. <laughs> She's like, you know, you're at the store, you're hungry and you see like a crappy chocolate bar. And then but before you take it, you're like, am I going to, am I going to enjoy this when I eat it? Or is it just cause I'm super hungry or do I wait out and hold out for the, uh, the really nice, like lint dark chocolate bar, for example. And that's the, is it worth a diet? But <laughs> I like the, is it worth a diet? Because that just implied that you're just going to go get a better chocolate bar. It didn't imply that you're not having a chocolate oh, bar. Oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy that. Yeah, it's funny. I remember you just mentioned power to weight. And one of the first guests we ever had on was Dean Golich, who coached like Katerina and kind of all of those like earlier Olympians. And we like mentioned power to weight and he's like, what I have always told athletes is like, ignore the weight and focus on the training and the power will go up and that's going to make your power to weight better. And like, that's the focus. Yeah. So good. I come back to that so often. And when I reintroduced bacon into my life, um, I actually lost weight. So I don't know if it's like a direct correlation, but (laughs) I'm not saying I'm starting a new trend or a fad diet here, but, uh, (laughs) a bacon diet. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Um, All right, just taking a quick pause from today's episode to bring you a quick ad for spring classic training. That's right. End of January. It's things are coming up fast. And Part- for our Ontario racers, you know, Northern US racers, Paris to Ancaster is, you know, this is like a crown jewel. This is thousands of people of all different abilities uh, come and it's actually gravel nationals this year is it really it is it oh, is oh boy so there's jerseys on the line and you know what we have we have the paris to ancaster three months away training plan and when you're listening to this the day this podcast comes out we're pretty much the time is now you need to start getting specific and getting ready for paris to ancaster so we have this ready to go on training peaks and if you want to know you know my favorite workouts to get folks ready for 
Paris Dancaster, that plan is up on the Training Peak store. So you can see that link in the show notes. Uh, and I hope you check it out. So has anything major shifted like in your training since, you know, first starting out? Like obviously now there's a lot more emphasis on just actually getting out on the trails and stuff. Any any thoughts on like how you've managed to keep improving your mountain bike skills over the years? Because courses have gotten significantly more technical in the last few years. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um all the features and stuff that we're faced with now and they're they're definitely challenging i think i'm just really fortunate um where i grew up so i live in bc on the west coast which is notoriously you know the most technically challenging riding in the world um so having just had that exposure um to that type of riding it's for like since 1996 um that's definitely been a boost for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, like then there's, then there's the man-made features, which they're not really part of my repertoire and that's, that's been challenging. So, um, I have spent more time actually specifically training, you know, for that, for jumps or pump tracks or, um, just that type of, that type of feature. So Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's been a change. Yeah, because I mean, even the short tracks now, like half of them have pump tracks, it seems like. Um, yeah, it's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Any any pump track tips that you've picked up as far as like navigating those whoops or just just get through them? Just yeah, don't ask me. I like I just did a, a skill sec- session this week with a coach and he was making fun of my pump track skills because and it, he really like highlighted why in whenever there's a pump track section in a race course, why riders stack up behind me in a line because <laughs> I, apparently I was doing the timing all wrong with my arms so now I have to relearn that part but anyway at least I know now why it was happening <laughs> and that's actually like see I think that's actually really interesting to hear is that you still do work with a coach when you need to work on a technical skill like that's huge and that's something I think a lot of people are like nervous about doing or wouldn't consider doing, but we always laugh because we're like, you'd work with like a golf coach, you'd work with a swim coach, but so few people will work with a cycling coach on skills, but it makes a huge difference. (laughs) Yeah. And I feel like constantly revisiting the basics too, like the fundamentals, um, that's super important and will help overall riding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like, I don't even like, if I want to work on skills, I want, I want to work on the basics, like, cause that'll make everything better. Yeah. Okay. What's like your favorite, like, you know, like descending, climbing, rock garden, like what's your favorite technical feature that you're just like, I kick ass at this. Hmm. I'm pretty good at technical climbing. Yeah. Okay. What's the, what's the trick? What's the skill? It's basically just keep pedaling because if you give up early, then you're done, but you never know if you keep pedaling, you could make it. It's true. I'm so bad for that where I like half unclip when I'm like starting to get uncertain, which means that immediately you're putting your foot down. There's no saving it. Once you've started to unclip, it's all over. Right. Yeah. So sometimes, you know, like I tell people just like keep pedaling till you fall over because you might actually make it. I love that. I love that. Um, The other thing I kind of wanted to talk to you about is, is you've, we talked about this a little offline. You kind of alluded to it a bit here. You've developed so many great friendships over the year in cycling. And I'm like hesitant to bring it up because I get super pissed whenever announcers, like I'm sure you've heard this in races. I don't know how how well you can hear the announcers as you're racing. I get so annoyed when the announcers are like, they are vicious competitors. Like they are trying to murder each other, but it's okay because they are best friends off the field. And you're like... You don't point that. They never pointed out in the men's race. They only pointed out in the women's race because like there's this weird fear we have of like suggesting that the women might actually be aggressively competing with each other. We have to be like, but it's okay because they really like each other and they're best friends. <gasps> but you genuinely are very close with a lot of the women in the in the the circuit. So how do you how do you stay friends with these women for so many years when you are going after the same you know, literally like the, the win at nationals and, you know, you are like competing for spots on teams and places at world cups and all of that stuff. How do you stay friends? I think it would be way harder to be enemies with everyone you're racing with (laughs) than to be, 
you know, like when you're in a race and you're surrounded by friends, that's pretty awesome. But if every if you hated everyone and everyone hated you, I don't think it would be very fun. And I don't think I'd still be doing it. So <laughs> a fantastic answer. <laughs> Plus, I think, I don't know, you if you're friends with them, you can pre-ride with them and you can warm down with them. And that's like. I, I actually this the last couple of years when I've been I've been actually privateering a lot and traveling on my own I really had some like low points and and was struggling and I realized that the social part is probably just important as important to me as everything else um, if I didn't have anyone to share like the racing experience with it felt pretty sad and lonely and and I wasn't really having fun. So um, I really realized I need to actually work more and be really, you know, act proactive about like reaching out to people and making coffee dates and ride plans while I'm traveling and while I'm on the road. Um, otherwise, yeah, otherwise I would just kind of get really sad and lonely. So um, yeah, so for me, racing is not just about racing. It's about the whole, the whole experience, the travel, um, the friendships, and then also trying to bring out the best in myself on the race oh, course. So good. Uh, and that leads us very neatly into the the big thing I wanted to talk to you about. BC Bike Race, you won it this year. Congratulations. That's exciting. Thank There's you. a great shot of you and uh, Peter DeSera both spraying champagne. That I, I love you both look so stoked. So talk to me about how that race went. Was it, I forget, was that the first time you did BCBR or... Had you done it? No, I've I've done it. I've completed it once before. I always forget if it was 2008 or 2009. Um, And I I was doing it as a mixed part of a mixed team. Okay. So it had been a while. Yeah. So, so it was like a very different experience. I'm like a very different athlete now, Um, much stronger, (laughs) but also at that time I was injured. So the, the memories aren't as great from that first time, but I always knew I wanted to come back. Um, and this time it, as a, a solo rider, which was, I, I kind of enjoy that too, just being in control of my own little world rather than having to <laughs> worry about someone else. So that was fun. Um, yeah, it went really well. I was, <laughs> I had come back from Europe from the last world cup 10 days before. And then the day after I came home from, from Europe, I tested positive for COVID. So, so I, yeah, so definitely I called it my, my COVID taper for a BC bike race. (laughs) It worked really well. I like really didn't stress about, um, training or like missing training. I, it was because it was, I would, I mean, after the world cup, I was in top race form, right? Like nothing I did or didn't, or nothing I could do in those 10 days could make me race better but if I had tried to force myself to train while I was ill I could have definitely messed everything up so I just rested really hard um and then you know came into BC bike race pretty fresh (laughs) and what was that experience like because that's a BC bike race is very different than a world cup weekend it's how many stages like just back to back to back to back a lot of racing how do you how do you how did that feel on on the body there? <laughs> yeah, it was it's seven days of racing, um, <laughs> but they're all pretty short. Like it's BC Bike Race has evolved as well, kind of like XCO has evolved from long to short. Um, BC Bike Race is now like using this format of very single track heavy, fun kind of destination courses that you do a big you do a loop, and you know like. Four, it was, I think my, the longest stage was just under four hours. So not crazy long. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Um, I treated it as a, a vacation. My partner and I um, were racing it. Well, not as a team, but we raced, we were together. So um, we, you know, I splurged and we rented a, a camper van for it, which I highly recommend um, if you can use a camper van for that and yeah I just it was also like a reward for me I at the beginning of the season I signed up and and was 
targeting it. This is my this is my celebration of the season. Like the end, it's kind of like the end of year party. Um, and I really treated it as as such. It was it's such a fun atmosphere too. Like you really get to know the people you're racing around, and you get to hang out after and and talk and chill. And yeah, it was just a really fun thing. I love that. Okay, other than renting a camper van. Now that you've been through it, stage race, best practices. What were you like happy you did in terms of whether it's like gear or recovery or, you know, post-race, pre-race, anything like that? Like, what would you recommend for people? Give me all the tips or all the mistakes, either way. (laughs) Um, Definitely making sure your bike is in really good condition before you start um, because you're going to be wearing stuff out throughout the week of hard riding. And then with BC bike race, you can purchase, um, like mechanic or like bike maintenance packages. So then at the end of the day, you give your bike to the mechanics and they, they get it all ready for the next day. I did, if you're like good with bikes or good at maintaining your own bike, um, I, that's not necessarily necessary. I think I just, we were also lucky because it was dry and sunny all week. So like next year, for example, it's on Vancouver Island might not be so lucky so that makes a difference too but just making sure like after your stage is finished you like take care of yourself so you fuel um you know shower and change and then like also look after your bike right away because if you don't do your like if you don't lube your chain wipe and lube your chain and all that stuff right after and then you realize the next morning it's not done yet you could be i mean it's just an extra thing to think about Yeah. I've always noticed that in stage racing, you sort of have like, I'd say 30 minutes when you finish the stage where you're still functioning enough to think like, okay, I should clean my bike and lube the chain and I should shower and get out of my chamois and like do that stuff. Cause then after that, I feel like, especially after a couple of days, it's just like, you're just cracked. You're not, you're not coming back to that bike three hours later. Like (laughs) it's not happening. The fatigue really stacks up into the week. So Um, if you can kind of get into that routine right away, um, it's really helpful. And I found like just preparing my bottles as well, Camelback and, um, you know, like race food for the next day, having that all ready to go. So when you wake up in the morning, you just like coffee, breakfast, (laughs) like chamois and get on your bike and you're good. Um, I did do like tire pressure check every, every morning. That's just something I do for performance, for bike performance, depending on the race course and then your obviously your tires will lose a bit of air overnight anyway so Mm -hmm. um yeah it's tire pressure is something i'm pretty particular about Mm -hmm. oh and then sorry no Uh, go ahead (laughs) speaking of tire pressure i also um was running tire inserts because for you know you want reliability um a tire insert will hopefully help you avoid flatting but if you do flat it's something that you can ride on um Mm -hmm. for a while anyway so Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about food because I feel like this is also one of those weeks where like you basically get like palate fatigue by day four like not just for your race food but like I feel like for food in general you're just so tired that eating is just like an extra thing how do you how do you make sure you're eating enough (laughs) Yeah, that's kind of what a friend of mine who's a pretty experienced um, stage racer, she she was texting me through the week and she's like, just like, you have to force yourself to eat. And it it, it does become a thing. And yeah, I, I ate a lot of candy, a lot of potato chips, like anything, right? Anything that you can get in um, and without like <laughs> wanting to throw up again. So yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't really thinking about like healthy options. I was just thinking about calories at that point. But. I always laugh because after those things, you're just like craving salads so much when you're done. You're just like, I just want some leafy greens. Yeah. Could be some fiber, <laughs> anything. <laughs> I would, we would eat out too. Like I kind of, you know, with the camper van, I'm like, oh, ahead of before I was like, oh, we can cook our meals. And be so nice. <laughs> and in the end, it was just like, let's be honest. <laughs> I don't feel like cooking. Um, so we, we would eat out. Yeah. I think there's also just like no way that you're getting more calories. Like when you cook at home than you would, if you're like out for like burgers or Thai food or whatever, like that's where you're getting the real calories. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and then I know you're in a camper van, but sleep wise, any, any suggestions for people who like maybe struggle with sleep at these? Did you use like an eye mask or anything like that? Or are you just like a, I'm just out kind of person? I know I'm a very light sleeper, so I definitely use an eye mask. I, I have those, um, sleep buds, those like those white noise making, and I've been using those for years because I am such a light sleeper that like any any kind of sound will wake me up and it took me a long time to realize that I was a light sleeper but when I just when I actually you know people would say oh I, I was I slept so great last night I'm like oh didn't you hear the thunder <laughs> didn't you hear such and didn't you hear the rain didn't you hear and they're like no and then after a while I'm like if I'm the only one hearing these things that means that I'm a light sleeper I think so um, I started using earplugs and that just like changed my life and then using the the fancy sleep buds is even better. Okay. You're going to have to send me which sleep buds you use uh, because we could definitely, I, I could use that for sure. Okay. Uh, in the van, the second anything, now that we have our, our not camper van, but sleep in van, uh, the second anything like taps the roof, it's like an instant wake up. So I feel like those would be very, very helpful. Yeah. I'll send you that. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, anything else you learned from the the stage racing? Um, maybe even I'm kind of thinking about like the pacing of it, like day one compared to day seven. Like, did you have any strategy going in, or were you just like, I'm just gonna go? Yeah, and I think it depends on the person. Like, I know myself pretty well as an as a rider by now. So I and I've always like I've done stage races in the past as well. I've done Trans Rockies and. Um, some road stage races and some other mountain bike stage races. And so through that experience, I've learned that I call myself a a one day wonder. So, which is why I'm so suited to cross country, I think. But um, basically I just get slower after the first day. (laughs) (laughs) So you got to really make that first day count. Absolutely. And I know other people like Catherine, for example, she gets faster and, and, it's just, yeah, it's just physiology. So, so I really do have to make the first few days count because after that, I just start to get slow and tired. So I really did like the first stage was a, was a very short prologue stage time trial. So I just basically went as hard as I could. And I think I already had a two minute lead after the first stage. And then basically the, all the days after that, I would just race race as hard as I could and but I did slow down and um one of the stages Catherine yeah she she set the pace hard from the start and I just like couldn't do it and but I like I I I was waiting for that day I knew it would happen so I was pretty stoked for her that she pulled out such a strong ride and then um and took the win no, I think that is such an important thing to like know yourself and know that like someone else's tactic of like going out super hard. If you know, maybe you're actually going to get stronger in the week, like maybe don't burn that match the first day. But if you know your tendency is that you're going to sort of start falling off, then yeah, use that match while you've got it. <laughs> yeah. And I have like, I have tried the other way too. I have tried to conserve and it was always the same result anyway. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Yeah, I feel like a lot of people are really excited for stage races now. It seems like that's that's kind of this this new form of very like fun summer campy kind of racing that people are just into now. Totally. It's so fun and because you really do like it's this community and you're like it is like summer camp. You're you're always seeing the same people and you get to know them. Um you get to know these cool new trail networks and it's like it's almost like it's like a vacation or like a guided a guided tour except you're racing so you get like all these amazing courses that are already laid out for you you get the aid stations and timing so you you don't have to worry about like pulling out your phone and looking at trail forks and wondering which trail is the most fun like everything's already done for you so um Mm -hmm. all you have to do is ride your bike yeah, I keep hoping one of these races is going to shift to like a format where they have like a run and a bike. So that way Peter and I can both like happily race it. So we'll see. I mean, I feel that, yeah, that should be a thing. It should be. Yeah. Like just do half the course as like the run. I mean, honestly, like a lot of us would be like, yeah, I could totally do, you know, seven days of like 50K to 50 miles. That's a reasonable human thing to do. <laughs> so Maybe one day. 
Uh, the problem is always like I actually tried that at um Transylvania Epic a few years back. I ran a couple of the stages and on like the enduro days I was passing people. So it was actually like really bad for the race. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a bit of a, a speed problem. <laughs> I think you're onto something though. I think so. Awesome. Okay, before we go, tell everyone where they can find you, where they can follow along as uh, as we head into the next, oh gosh, next season already. <laughs> I know, it's exciting. So I'm at Sandra Walter MTB on the Instagram and Facebook is the same. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sandra. I can't believe it's taken us so long to do this, but I'm glad we finally made it happen. Same. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you want to hear more training, racing, and endurance sport advice, make sure you subscribe to the podcast and leave us a rating and review. You can also subscribe to our newsletter at consummateathlete.com for a weekly dose of inspiration and advice straight to your inbox. 